This looks like a regular park, right? Kids playing, ducks swimming, and there's that fountain that always seems to be running no matter the time of year. So what if I told you that this place, Hampton Park, was once a cemetery, but not just any cemetery, one dedicated to more than 250 Civil War soldiers, which also just so happens to be home of the first ever Memorial Day ceremony. They had a, a small children's choir sing, preachers preached. So it was their way of dedicating uh, not only the graves of the dead, but it was also uh, their way of declaring the meaning of the Civil War and declaring, um, you know, a federal union victory. That's right. But back then, it was called Decoration Day. And over time, that name changed to Dedication Day. It wasn't until the 1960s when Memorial Day became the official name. But whatever you call it, it all started right here in Charleston, South Carolina. And we know about this important history because of this guy. I was at Harvard University on a fellowship in the Houghton Library, and I was working in a collection of Union veterans' papers. One of the boxes in a file labeled the first decoration day, I found this story, uh, was about this parade that occurred on a ho horse track, a race course in Charleston, South Carolina, led by African-American former slaves in early May, 1865. And when I first read it, I, I really could hardly believe it. I thought, now this is some old veteran making up something and he had nothing else to do. He's just recording it. Back in 1865, photography was barely a thing. And obviously there was no such thing as video. So here's what we think happened. Leading up to May 1st, dozens of black Charlestonians exhumed a mass grave of more than 250 men. They then dug individual graves into rows, building a 10 foot tall white fence around them with an archway overhead spelling out martyrs of the race course. And on the actual decoration day, it's estimated that 10,000 mostly formerly enslaved black people commemorated those lives with a parade. They sang hymns, decorated graves, had picnics, and watched Union troops perform marches and drills. It all sounds familiar, right? I mean, imagine being part of that march that day on that old racetrack to suddenly have the power to be part of that parade. Um, it's an event that can put you back inside the meaning of something much, much larger than just that one parade. So why haven't we heard about it before? Well, I think it's a classic case of how memory works, how, how public collective memory works. Uh, this was not a story white Charlestonians wanted to remember. So you had groups like the Daughters of the Confederacy that included people such as Mildred Rutherford down in Georgia and Mary Sims Oliphant here in South Carolina, who changed the narrative to eliminate any reference to the fact that the Civil War was largely over the issue of the continuation of slavery in the South. And basically they taught pro-Confederate pseudo-history and downplayed a lot of the more positive aspects of the African-American history. And unfortunately, the average person across the board mainly knows what they are told. Now I know what you're thinking. All of this happened so long ago. How do we even know if it's real? Well, historians fact-checked it. You see, in history, we use a process that's called primary research. So essentially looking for primary sources is going to is looking for materials from as close to the event as possible and seeing if these multiple sources agree pretty much on the same facts, then more than likely, it's probably true. In addition to the New York Tribune account, Blight found an article in Harper's Weekly Magazine. And with the help of the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture that's based in Charleston, they found an article about the commemoration in the Charleston Daily Courier, dated May 1st, 1865. This first Memorial Day is just a microcosm. You know, it's a, it's a classic small example, a remarkable event, let's face it, that just got almost completely lost under the weight, ironically, of the lost cause. 